Jam and Dr. Uh, Sep Sepulo. And I saw in the attendance there is also the other our uh, uh, lecturer, Pak Andri and Pak Astika Pamumpi, Pamumpuni. Thank you for coming to this, uh, this lecture. Actually, this, this lecture is organized by uh, Geological Engineering Department, Faculty of Art Science and Technology ITB. We really appreciate uh, your participation. Now, I am Idam Andri Kurniawan from Geological Engineering ITB. I will be your moderator for today. We may, we may now start a guest lecture. Actually, this is part of our collaboration between ITB and University of uh, Oxford that has been started since 2017 and followed by collaboration with many institutions like from UK, including BGS, University of Birmingham, National Oceanographic Center, and also with the uh, University of Tasmania. And next year, when, yeah, yeah, next year we will have a research collaboration so in Anak Rakatau. And the topic today's session is volcanology. Today we will discuss about the recent advance and hazards mitigation in submarine volcanism. Let me introduce the invited speaker, Dr. Martin Sessler. Uh, he was got a PhD from Earth Science at this uh, in uh, Tasmania University, Australia. He specializes in submarine volcanology. And now his position is a senior research fellow in volcanology and sedimentology at the University of Tasmania. And also, uh, how, how to I say, uh, there is a School of Nature Science and also Center of Ore Deposit and Earth Sciences Codes. Yeah, uh, both of them, the both of the institution. <laughs> and then, ladies and gentlemen, there will be a short question and answer session at the end of the presentation. To ask the question, audience may use Q&A feature in the Zoom or write your question in the YouTube comment section during the presentation. Because the question should be in the following format, name, institution, affiliation, and question. Due to the time limitation, we will select three questions and then continue to the remaining if the time is adequate. Before we start the presentation from the uh, invited speaker, I would like to welcome Dr. Ivan Melano, the Dean of Faculty of Art Science and Technology, ITB, to give the opening speech. Dr. Ivan Melano, please welcome. Thank you, Dr. Idam. Uh, hello, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome you to today's guest lecture by Dr. Martin Zeller from University of Tasmania. <coughs> Uh, accurately quantifying the risk associated with volcanic hazard um, required detailed monitoring. And technological improvement have made that may possible to monitor terrestrial volcanoes to increasingly high degrees of accuracy. And as a geodesist, um, I, in the past, I used several genetic method to observe volcano, such as GPS, tilt meter, strain meters, and we can create a detailed detail record mm -hmm. on morphological change through time associated with the volcanic activity. And by combining this data with the satellite image technology, such as SAR, Synthetic Aperture Radar, which has the capacity to measure deformations to centimeter scale, these data set are powerful resources in attempt to assess volcanic risk. But in the submarine conditions, the work of monitoring volcanoes is much more difficult. We had limited understandings of the behaviors of submarine volcanoes, uh, volcanoes uh, despite associated hazard including potentially tsunami, uh, tsunami genic landslide and eruptions are very high. The one that we had in Indonesia a few years ago, the uh, tsunami due to the Krakatoa volcano eruption and landslide. So I would like to thanks to Martin uh, for sparing his valuable time with us to share his knowledge related with the recent advance in hazard mitigations of submarine volcano. We have, suffer, 
we have several submarine volcano in Indonesia. And I hope we can learn from his long time ex experience with the hope that we can reduce the risk of submarine volcanic eruptions in Indonesia. And I wish you all a very successful webinar. Again, Martin, thank you for your time. Well, thank you very much for this introduction and to give me the possibility to give this lecture here. Uh, it's a really uh, a great opportunity to me, for me to um, be able to communicate some uh, of my research and to try to show what's possible to do now uh, in submarine volcano energy and uh, where we need more time and uh, passion to uh, understand how to mitigate risks uh, in submarine volcanism and in volcanism in general. Yeah. All right. Um, so I'm going to share my screen, if that's fine with you. Yes, yes, sure. Yeah. Yep. Martin, please. Um, so I'm going to share that. Can you see my screen now? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yes. Um, here we go. So that's a view um, of a sailing boat that was on the Tonga Islands, north of New Zealand, and they arrived into a pumice raft. And that's the kind of uh, signal from submarine volcanism that we can see sometimes. So I'm going to talk about this pumice raft a bit later on, but I just want to show you this opportunity to, of this very weird and bizarre uh, view of the product of a submarine eruption. And you see that the, the, the sea here is covered by volcanic crust that we call pumice. And this pumice floats at the surface of the ocean and get dispersed by wind and uh, ocean currents. So those sailing boats were very fortunate to, to cross this raft. And they were actually the first people who actually noticed that it was a submarine uh, volcanic eruption in the area. We don't have any way to identify submarine volcanic eruptions occurring uh, nowadays. In most cases, uh, those volcanoes are very remote. And so we don't have any instruments to uh, forecast those eruptions. Um, as uh, presented, uh, as uh, said before uh, by the Dean, the, we, we, we kind of really understand what's happening now with the subrail volcanism, and we can identify when there's a volcanic eruption occurring. We also can identify the deposits of those volcanic eruptions. I'm just going showing here some photos. You have Krakato to the top left. Uh, can you see my? Can you see my my mouse here? You have a classic volcanic eruption that shows incandescent red hot uh, magma into the atmosphere and it lands very close to the volcano. You may have much bigger eruption that creates big volcanic plumes that are spread over the uh, in the atmosphere and can can cross the, the entire world. And we have also the surface expression from volcanism by creating big craters. That's a one kilometer diameter crater in Mexico. And here from a crater with a crater lake that grew after the eruption in 1982. So we, we understand the, <clears throat> the basic concept of uh, volcanism, subial volcanism, the volcanism that uh, is uh, on land, but things get much more complicated when we go under the water. So one option is to look at uplifted submarine volcanic successions. So we go on land to look at uh, deposits that were erupted underwater. And the classic example are those pillow lavas that you see here to the left, top left, or top right. Those pillow lavas really show um, submarine eruption occurring, but it's very eff it's effusive lava. There's no explosions. It's very uh, docile or tranquil uh, eruption. You have also other types of eruptions underwater. Sometimes it's much more explosive and more dynamic and more powerful. And you can create stratigraphy like here to the top, uh, top right, where we have a, a succession of deposits from submarine eruptions that have been <coughs> uplifted. So those successions can be uh, as young as tertiary or even quaternary in some, time, in some times, but mostly tertiary. But we also find some eruptions in the Archean. 
So we have a record of submarine eruptions that occurred throughout the entire time of uh, Earth. Got another uh, view here that's a very classic view from submarine deposits is that they're extremely planar because they deposited underwater. <coughs> There's no erosion underwater. And so the deposits tend to be extremely laterally continuous. So that's an option to go uh, walking on land to look for submarine deposits. But it doesn't inform us on modern volcanism. It informs us on what type of volcanism was in the past. <coughs> So if we, want modern, uh, if we want to study modern volcanism, we need to look, we need to take a boat, basically, or to go with a satellite. So that's the two options we have currently. Uh, either you can take a boat and you can bring instruments on it. So I'm going to show examples of what we call an AUV, an automated underwater vehicle. And those are robots that are fully independent and can go close to the seafloor and map. And mapping is extremely important because this uh, mapping is at extremely high resolution. And so we can get a very good ID and understanding on the morphology of the volcano. We can go with other robots that we call uh, ROVs, remotely operated vehicles. And here it's Jason that has some robotic arms there that can be controlled at distance from the boat. And you can start sampling the volcanic product. So that's another way to better understand uh, the, the eruption products and to reconstruct uh, the style of eruption. We have the possibility also to drill the seafloor for academic purpose. So that's a drill ship, that's the joyous resolution. And that's uh, a ship that is used by the international community to recover cores, uh, so samples that have been cored into the seafloor. And that's an example here of a core uh, and this ship is extremely powerful. It's, um, it's been used since the, the, the early 80s, this ship. And uh, it collected hundreds and hundreds of kilometers of rocks from the seafloor and at depths up to two, two kilometers below seafloor. So that's extremely powerful uh, tool. You can also use geophysics. So you can use a boat that has uh, geophysical instruments on board that allow uh, inference on the stratigraphy beneath your volcano. And that's another tool is the satellites can be used to monitor or to uh, evaluate the some <coughs> style of volcanism. And we're going to look at examples of that today as well. Today, I'm going to talk mostly about the Kermadec and the Tonga arc. So here north of New Zealand, I'm based in Tasmania in the little island that has a uh, almost no volcanoes, just a few little tertiary volcanoes that are uh, extremely small and boring. Um, I'm also going to talk about some marine volcanoes in the Kermadec and Tonga Arc, and I'm going to quickly introduce the Krakato eruption as well. So Indonesia is extremely blessed by so many volcanoes on the land. Uh, volcanoes in Indonesia are extremely useful for agriculture and life, but they also have the risk attached to them. So I'm going to talk a little bit about Krakatoa at the end of this lecture. So my aims in my research, it's to better comprehend the submarine and marine volcanism. So anything that produces volcanic uh, material that ends up into the water. And I'm interested in understanding the eruption style. So how the eruption occurs but also what happens to all those, this volcanic material that is being um, produced and uh, put into water. And the, um, the link to this is to understand the, the, to identify and understand the hazards that submarine volcanism could cause. Um, it's less obvious than subial volcanism. It's probably going to be less common, but it doesn't mean that the hazards are not uh, present. I'm also interested to identify uh, su uh, volcanic successions and understanding if this was created by an eruption or if it was more the product of a landslide. And in many cases, actually, there's no eruption occurring. It's just a landslide, part of the volcano that goes down by gravity. I'm also interested in predicting the dispersal of volcanic flotsam. That's those pumice rafts that I was introducing at the early uh, stage of my talk. 
And uh, there's some applications in volcanology. The application is to understand by looking at uh, modern volcanic vol volcan vol uh, sorry modern volcanic product to understand uh, the rock record better, but also to look at the real rock record and understand what type of modern volcanism we can expect. So I just want to give a quick introduction here about the, the style of sedimentation associated with volcanoes and what we expect as sedimentation from volcanoes. And then I'm going to show you that there's a lot of things that we don't know about that. So if I take a classic conventional continental margin, we have uh, on land a uh, mountain chain or some topography, a river arriving into the shelf, and then the sediments are transported down the canyons into uh, a submarine plane. So we have mass wasting event and river inputs that bring, that bring sediments to the shelf. And then these sediments are transported down slope by slides or turbidites. And then we send sediments at the very bottom of the slope. So that's the classic model. And the current models in volcanology uh, for subaerial eruptions that send products into the water or the submarine volcanoes that uh, erupt underwater and send their particles underwater, we have kind of the similar uh, scenario. We have also mass wasting events and eruptions. And this material is transported down slow by slides and turbidites. And we sediment also in distal basins. So it looks like it's, it's really like these similar processes. However, the volumes are very different, right? That's a very old seismic, uh, seismic uh, line from uh, the Izubanin arc in south of Japan. And we see this very big wedge here with planar sediments. And those have been drilled. And we know that it's formed of mostly uh, volcanic material that has been sedimented very flat at the base of a basin, at the bottom of a basin. So it, it, it matches our model. It makes sense. When we look at the rock record, we need to use uplifted test sequences, like I was saying. And when we are looking at modern seafloor, we can use bathymetry, so the topography underwater, or we can use seismic reflection, which gives us the stratigraphy from the sea under uh, below the seafloor. We can also get sediments from cores or dredges or deep water camera. Uh, views of the sediments and have a better idea of what type of deposits we have. But the main question that I usually ask myself, and that is quite hard to answer sometimes, is what are the key characteristics that, key, that indicate that these deposits are really eruption fed? Are they, they are, are they directly related to an eruption or are they more related to a mass wasting or a landslide? And this is quite important because if you characterize every single unit or volcanic unit as eruption fed, um, you will have an incredibly amount of eruptions. And that's not true. We have a lot of sediments that are simply results of the erosion of the volcano. So let's look at some data that, we, that got collected uh, now 15 years ago uh, in the Kamedek Arc. So north of New Zealand, we have this Kermadec arc that is mostly submarine, but some volcanoes are actually islands. And we have Macaulay and Raoul volcanoes that both have a bit of an island on, on their tip. So we know for, we've known for a while that those volcanoes actually do not show an very, uh, do not show the classic volcanic shape, smooth volcanic shape of, on, the, on the cone and then a deposit in the basin. What we see around those two volcanoes here is those big uh, waves, wave morphologies. So we call them waveforms or, uh, yeah, let's call them waveforms today. And those waveforms can arrive in very different, um, uh, very different aspects. So you have those waveforms here that are collected and around the caldera of Macaulay. This caldera is about five kilometer diameter. It's a really big volcano, right? Around Raoul, we have a submarine volcano here, but we have this volcanic island here that is surrounded by also waveforms 
But you see that those waveforms are quite different from those ones. So there's some differences. And it's really, really important to understand how those waveforms are created and why they, why they are there and what do they represent. So could they be related to turbidites from a little river that was uh, occurring on the island? Well, islands are very small, so it can't be that. Could they be contourites, so created by bottom ocean currents? Well, the contourites don't create shapes like this at all. Could they be landslides? Could they be extremely thick eruption-fed density currents, so big turbidites that have been produced by a single eruption? Or can they be hybrids, something in between different, uh, in between different uh, processes? So what is the significance of those waveforms? Are they eruption? What, what is the eruption style behind that? What is the style of sediment transport? And was it a catastrophic event? Do they record a catastrophic event? Was it a big splash creating a big tsunami? Or was it a slow creep of a landslide that did not produce any tsunami? That has really important consequences there to understand the, the, the flux, so the, 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 the speed of these events. And that has a, a consequence for the island evolution and the stability of, uh, of your island. Is the island is going to collapse uh, in 1 million years or in 100,000 years? Or, and what are the possible hazards for the local maritime traffic, but also for distant coasts with tsunami? So if we look at Raoul Island, that was the island <coughs> right in my lecture, we see there a 3D view that is combined data from bathymetry, but also seismic reflection. So we have an idea of the topography of a volcano, but we also know the morphology within the volcano at uh, a couple of hundreds of meters below sea floor. So it's really, really important data and extremely useful data. And we see in this case that we have big faults, big listric faults and decolment happening here in blue and in purple. And we have backward rotated blocks here. It's internally chaotic and we have a positive toe at the bottom of the slope. And, all, and there's a big head scarp here. So there's mass missing there and the mass has been transported lower down. So in this case, it really looks like that it is a slope failure. And we can schematize this by having a volcano here to the right. And we have a landslide that dismantled the, slide, the, the, the slope of your volcano into big blocks. So it becomes a, a, a landslide that we don't know how fast it was going, but we know that it created these morphologies. These landslides can be created either because the volcano is unstable or because there's so many earthquakes in this area that it makes the volcano unstable. If we look at Makori, the volcano, the other volcano I was presenting before, things are very different. Um, we see that these waveforms are actually concentrically around the caldera and they fan out and the morphology becomes finer and finer downslope. It's laterally extensive and we, and we look at the volume of, of those sediments, we arrive at about 20 to 30 cubic kilometers. So that's enormous amount of material that have been deposited there at the slope of the volcano. Um, sorry for that. If we look at the seismic reflection data, we have spectacular information about this volcano. So we have a seismic reflection profile here from the top to the bottom. And here that's top to bottom. We have the flow direction here from right to left. And what we see is that those waveforms are actually uh, not homogeneous, but they are stratified. And we have dunes created there. And those dunes are absolutely enormous. I'm giving you a blow up here, a 3D view of again the bathymetry and the seismic reflection at the bottom. And that's a blow up view of the seismic reflection of one of those big dunes. So look at the scale. We have a dune that is 
about 150 meter high for a kilometer of wavelength. That's something we do not find subialy. That's something that is only restricted to specific conditions of sedimentation underwater at the foot of very large volcanoes. And to create those dunes, actually, it, they are not dunes. They are what we call anti-dunes. So they, are, they reflect very high sedimentation rates and erosion of the substrate. So we have what we call anti-dune and cyclic steps, where you have the sedimentation from right to left, and the sedimentation occurs so fast that it erodes, erodes the substrate and creates dunes that are planar bedded, mostly, and they are migrating upslope. So just the opposite from a normal dune or aeolian dune, aeolian dune that you would find uh, on a beach. So it reflects very high degree of flux. And it's related, it's linked to the caldera margin, margin, showing that there's a very, very high probability that it's related to an eruption that created the caldera. So that's what we call eruption-fed sediment waves. And those sediment waves uh, have been found in many other volcanoes. It's not the simple single volcano that has that. We now identified several volcanoes that, that have those sediment waves. So in summary, we have possi possibility to find submarine landslides that can be identified from submarine eruption-fed deposits. And under specific contexts, we can have extremely voluminous and powerful explosive eruptions that can create those sediment waves. And the sediments are mostly accumulated on the slope of the volcano and not in the basins. So it's a very different from the previous models. And those sediment waves are, as I was saying before, are much thicker and extensive than any other wave fields that you would find uh, on land. Um, we have some paraclastic flows on land that create some dunes, but those dunes are one to 10 meters thick maximum. And here we're talking about uh, 100 to 150 meters thick. So it's, it's a different scale. It's a different order of magnitude. So to identify better what's happening with those eruption uh, fed sediment waves, to understand the style of eruption that created those eruption, uh, those uh, sediment waves, and to better understand how to differentiate them from landslides. Uh, I'm leading a, a voyage that was planned for next week, but uh, it's been postponed to March 22 uh, because of COVID. So we're going to conduct more seismic reflection and coring. So try to core those sediment wave deposits to better understand what they made of and what style of eruption they represent, and to try to estimate the flux related to this eruption. And the, the final step is to model those sediment waves and also to model what type of tsunami they could, those eruptions could create. So to create a big volcanic caldera and with a major eruption is quite rare but we need to calculate the risks uh, associated with that, uh, simply because uh, those caldera forming eruptions are rare, but they exist. And you have uh, the classic example in Indonesia with Krakatoa. In 1883, you had a volcanic island that became, uh, that was totally destroyed by the 1883 uh, eruption of Krakatoa volcano. So those calderas can occur, and we need to better understand um, how they form in and how often they form. Now I'm going to go uh, to pass to a, a different type of study. Uh, I see that I'm quite late in my talk. I'm going to go a bit faster. Um, just talking about eruptions underwater a bit more in depth. Eruptions underwater are possible. They are not rare. 75% of volcanism occurs underwater. So it's very common. But most of the volcanism actually occurs as lava flows, so effusive eruptions that are not explosive. And this is related to the, the amount of water above them. So more, the more water you have, the more weight you have on top of the volcano. And this weight of water does not allow the magma to vesiculate and to get uh, 
out of the surface very fast. So you, you do not allow most magmas to erupt explosively, but they create lava flows. So we have the classic example of pillow lavas for basaltic compositions. And when we go in more felsic compositions, more evolved silica content uh, uh, eruptions, we create domes and lavas that we call also with the carapace, carapace of hyaloclastites. So we have coherent domain of lavas, but also fragmented domains of the lavas, uh, like a big outer breccia on top of a classic subial volcano. So we have lots of fragments of volcanic rocks that are created actually by effusive eruptions. So in some cases, there's enough gas in the system to create volcanic eruptions that are explosive. So in this case, we fragment the magma and we create a jet phase here that contains magmatic gas and volcanic fragments. And this jet is mixing with water and during ingestion of water within those clasts, most of the clasts start sinking and they create density caverns or turbidites. The big clasts will not be able to uh, suck in enough water and they're going to start, uh, they, they, they're going to continue uh, their ascent and float at the surface of the ocean in creating pumice rafts. So that's the model that was created in 1996. And uh, since then, there's been lots of research that confirmed some such model, but also infirmed this model in some cases. And we're going to look at that a bit further uh, today. I'm not going to talk about shallow vol submarine volcanic eruptions like fragmentary magmatism. That's something that I'm not going to talk here today because I'm not mostly involved in, in such type of eruptions. But just know that when you have a very shallow volcanic eruptions, so I'm talking about zero to 130 meters below sea, below sea level, we can create extremely explosive volcanic eruptions uh, due to a specific uh, dynamic of uh, magma water interactions. Uh, I'm going to pass that. And I'm going to give you a, 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 an example of an eruption that occurred in 2012. Uh, a, a very, very interesting uh, eruption that occurred uh, in the Kamedek Arc, north of New Zealand. And on the 17th of July, 2012, there was an eruption and nobody knew about it for about three weeks because uh, nobody was is living there. And it's only after three weeks that somebody noticed something at the surface of the ocean from a commercial airplane. Uh, that gives you the, uh, that gives you a, a note of, of, uh, of that gives you an understanding of how, how, how we cannot monitor submarine volcanism yet. Uh, it takes weeks sometimes to get information about a submarine volcanic eruption. So this volcano is a caldera volcano, and this eruption was at more than 900 meter, meter below sea level, so extremely deep, almost a kilometer depth. That's uh, very deep, right? It's a lot of water on top of the system, and that Create, that means that this volcano must have been very frothy. Lots of magmatic gas was present in this eruption to create uh, the deposit, dep deposited head. So what we know is that this volcano erupted in July 2012 and created a pumice raft. And I monitored the, the pumice rafts using satellite images. And we can see here the development of this pumice raft in black and then green and then red and blue for every week. And we see that this raft is dispersed enormously. That's a scale, 40 kilometer scale here. This raft is dispersed on the surface of the ocean by wind and uh, um, ocean currents. And this represents a part of the eruption product. And we have no idea about what happened underwater. So that creates a problem, right? We've got some part of the volcanic material that is floating and the other part of the volcanic material we have no idea about. This pumice raft dispersed and those pumice are floating for a long time. So dispersed after three months, that was this size, twice the size of New Zealand. And then it arrived into, it, it, might, it, it dispersed into Tonga and then it crossed this ocean and arrived onto Australia and ended up on my uh, in Tasmania, where I can still find some on the beach sometimes after uh, a big, a big uh, rough scene. 
So those pumice are migrating by mostly ocean currents and wind. And some of this, uh, this Havre eruption was so big that it littered the entire eastern coast of Australia. So that's the pumice after a couple of months or years uh, at sea. They get uh, uh, hitchhikers. Life is growing on them. And they uh, are, can cross entire oceans um, like this. So for this, I joined a voyage that was organized by a colleague in the University of Tasmania and at Woods Hole uh, in the US, where we had a boat and we had two robots with us to map the volcano and the water and also to take samples. And so that's the map that we have of the volcano. So you need to realize that this is under at least one kilometer of water. And the resolution, resolution of this map is one meter. It corresponds to uh, LIDAR, which is a radar uh, data from airborne survey on land. So it's unprecedented data, extremely, extremely precise data from an underwater volcano. And I was extremely, that was amazing to have this data set created on board. And we have a better idea now of where the eruptions occurred and what happened during this eruption. So look at the scale. The caldera is about four kilometer diameter. And that's what happens during this eruption. We have a major volcanic dome, so a lava flow here. And we have other lava flows or other domes that have been created along a fissure. So most of the eruption here that we see on, on, on the, on the seafloor is created of, is made of lava flows and lava domes. But what we got on the surface of the ocean were pumice, floating pumice. So it's extremely strange to have such differences in between the products of a single eruption. That's a blow up on a dome. So you see the beautiful dome that corresponds to a dome like you would find at Merapi, for example. And notice those, those, those big dots there. That's, not, uh, that's real data. And that shows very, very coarse pumice that have been sink, that sunk on the seafloor. So we had a robot there. I hope you can see the video. And that's the view of, from the robot on the seafloor. And you see that the, the entire caldera is littered by very, very big chunks of pumice. So those pumice have been uh, sent up, probably up to the sea, the sea level, and floated for a little while and then sunk again. And those pumice can be up to 10 meters in length. So it's extremely enormous. You don't find clasps like that severely. We have clasps here that are between one to five or six meters big. This big one here, up here, is probably six or seven meters long. It's extremely enormous, right? Uh, and the, the, the caldera is littered by those clasps. So that gave us extremely important information about how this eruption occurred. That's another view of this uh, beautiful data set, bathymetry data set. You see that this grainy structure here shows all the pumice that have been identified with this um, uh, robot. And you have some little landslides occurring there, or little scree occurring there in, inside the volcano, and where you don't see those big pumice anymore because they've been sent down. So, so the model, based on numerical modeling, we managed to bring a co colleagues of mine have managed to make a model of that. We can have slow ascent or deep eruptions that create only lava domes. In case you are very shallow, you will be able to fragment below the vent, so creating a real explosive eruption. And you have this case here that what we got at Havre volcano is in between, it's intermediate. So we create an eruption that is not frothy, there's not enough magmatic gas in the system to fragment because you are too deep. But the speed is so fast that the material is going to not flow like a lava dome, but to be projected within the, the water column and get disintegrated there, creating those giant pumice, creating a raft here. And some of those pumice sink back on the volcanic floor. So that's an intermediate situation where you have between a pure effusive system and a pure explosive system, where you have an effusion of lava that is going to be dismantled because it interacts with water and fragments like that. 
Now I'm going to going to talk about uh, another eruption that occurred actually only last year, and that was in the Tonga Arc. In the, the north of this Havre volcano, Havre is right there, and we're talking to, talking about a volcano that occurred just there to the north. So this Tonga Tofua Arc is very young, uh, means that it's also very active. There's lots of volcanism occurring there, and there's been recently many types of eruptions there. So a sailing boat was uh, happily sailing uh, in between Tonga and Fiji, and suddenly they crossed the Pamis Raft again, another Pamis Raft. This time, the, the Pamis are quite small. They're mostly um, the size of uh, maybe tennis ball maximum, but sometimes they found class up to 60 centimeter diameter. But most of the class were small up to from a pea size to, uh, let's say, a fist in size. All right, so thin rafts, no big deal for boats, but then sometimes it also gets much, much thicker. So here you have got 30 centimeter, uh, 30 to 60 centimeter thick rafts. So it's a, a big pile of pumice that can be crossed by a sailing boat, but it's kind of the limit, right? Uh, after that, the sailing boat would have extremely big problems uh, with uh, crossing this raft, and I'm going to talk about that a bit later on. But in this case, they were very fortunate to cross this Pamis raft and uh, alert the authorities about this. I've got a video taken from uh, this boat. So that went into uh, national, international news. So you may have heard about it. I'm trying to get this video working. and I'm not sure it's going to happen. Yes, so that's the video from the boat. And you see that this Pamis raft strongly attenuates the waves. So it's extremely smooth sailing and um, those permits are clinking clinking on each other they're touching each other and abrading each other all the time so you can find this video, video on youtube as well and you will have the sound as well that could be uh, that's, that's uh, quite interesting so this eruption occurred at midday on the 7th of august 2019 i could backtrack uh, from satellite images i could backtrack exactly when the eruption occurred and there's no sulfur or ash signature in the plume. It is just simply a, a steam plume occurring at the surface of the ocean. And the raft quickly expands into about 200 square, kilo, uh, square kilometers. It's day two, so it's a very quick spread of the raft. And it's a high silica endosite. So it's not as, uh, it's, it's not, the composition is not that high uh, in silica, but it allows uh, creation of pumice. And that's the pumice that got collected by those sailing boats, and I managed to get those samples back in Hobart, in Tasmania. So those are the samples collected at day two, and some are already rounded by the action of rounding onto each other, and some got collected on the beaches after hundreds of kilometers of, of, uh, of um, dispersal. And that's the coconut for scale. So some of them were very large and others were very tiny uh, at the end of their dispersal. So I used satellites to uh, monitor this raft and I was very interested in that. I spent a lot of nights uh, working on this and trying to understand where the raft was going and uh, what risk it would involve. So I used different types of um, satellites. Some satellites are moderate resolution, but they have only one or two photos a day. Uh, so which is really good to have a, a daily photo. And when you have high resolution satellites, uh, you may not, you, you won't have a daily photo, but you may have one photo every week or something like this. But it's very interesting because you can have uh, resolutions below the meter in some cases. So it's extremely interesting to get those uh, rafts mapped very carefully. And so that's the initiation of the eruption. We see here, that's a kilometer. Uh, that's a kilometer scale bar, and you see big bubbles, probably uh, coming, arriving here at the surface of the ocean, and some steaming from probably large pumice. And you have also this large steam cloud here occurring. So there's two what we call eruption rings, and then some steaming points occurring from that. You don't see the pumice raft forming. I think the, the pumice have not arrived yet, well, that's the first ones here from those steaming points. And then the cloud cover 
did not allow us to see anything. So for two days, we don't have data, and then we have a fantastic data set. Uh, this volcano had been mapped before, and it had also another pumice raft forming eruption in 2001. And so we can map exactly where those eruptions occurred. And you see that this caldera is about uh, five, six kilometers in diameter. So it's a big, big volcano, a complex volcano as well. And those eruptions occurred on the caldera rim on the top of a big lava dome. So that's quite interesting. And this 2019 eruption was about 200 meters below sea level. So it's much shallower than Havre but also a very different comp uh, magma composition. And I'm going to show you images of this raft dispersing uh, over the ocean from Tonga. Here, that's the eruption site. Then we're going to cross to the low islands and then Fiji. And then actually this raft reached Australia last uh, in last month after one, one year of dispersal managed to reach those pumice rafts to Australia. A uh, bit more specifically, blowing up here, I've got the eruption site and the raft actually traveled here, arrived to the low island, crossed them, crossed Fiji in this channel here, and actually mostly got stranded on those islands there. And then those, the weather changed and the, the, the raft managed to escape those islands and continued the dispersal towards Australia. Because we had good weather, uh, I have fantastic data set from uh, satellite images. So I compiled them. You have the eruption site here. On the 5th of August, you have an earthquake in this area. On the 7th of August, you have those eruption rings. And the 9th of August, you have the first rafts here. And those uh, dashed arrows show the sailing boats, sailing boats that crossed the raft. So it's, uh, we had very fortunately, lots of sailing boats that crossed this raft and took samples. And you see this pumice raft is migrating southwest, changing shape, dislocating into small rafts, and then starts swirling around and comes back north. So there's definitely a wind action happening here, but also an ocean currents that make it swirl and uh, change course. I remind you the scale, that's 20 kilometers. And there's a single island around there, that's Latte Island, that didn't get any pumice rafts arriving on it. So it's just open water. There's nothing else than a few sailing boats arriving there. If I was explaining what happened during the first 10 days, we were there, and then this raft migrated north, swirled again, and I lose track because of weather, and I find it back here on the 30th of August. And the 3rd of September, it arrives and surrounds Lakeba Island. So that's the view from satellite images. That's a moderate resolution satellite image that each pixel is about 250 meters on, uh, on a sea surface. You see this pumice raft in brown, that's the eruption site. In white, you have clouds. And in blue, you have this um, blue trail of the raft that corresponds to the pumice and fine particles sinking in the seawater. That's another view. That's a high resolution photo, image of the, of the raft. So the pixel is about 10 meters here. And you see that the raft is um, going towards the left. And we have bits of rafts that are constantly uh, getting lost. So you basically not erode your raft, but you dismantle it in smaller pieces. And those rafts travel about 20 kilometers a day. So um, there's, there's a lot of uh, travel from those rafts. And more and more, it gets dislocated and becomes uh, sometimes one big raft and then stringers of little rafts. That gets very hard to find out on uh, try to to survey this with satellite images. So that's a view of one day. You've got the scale of 30 centimeters. That's what happens when the raft is entrained into ocean currents that swirl. In dark red, you have uh, the major rafts, and in pale red, you have uh, the very the, the much uh, thinner rafts and more dilute rafts. That's what the raft, uh, what happens when the raft meets an island. You have the raft in gray here, surrounding the entire island, blocking the harbors on this island for several weeks. And actually some part of the rafts got uh, stranded for two months in this, on this island. Uh, very unfortunate for the inhabitants. You see here a little village there. 
and the rafts there stayed around, moved by wind and came back surrounding the island again. That was a big mess uh, here. And we have a fantastic imagery of those rafts snuggling those islands. That's a view from uh, Fiji Islands. That's when the pumice raft arrives on land. It blocks the sea. So that was the normal, sh that's the normal shore. And you can actually see the, 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 the breaks there at probably 200 or 300 meters away. So this boat is basically blocked here and you can't access the sea for a safe time. Um, the raft arrived in Fiji after several weeks of dispersal and actually got st stranded on Yazava Islands for two months. So for two months, the people there could not really access the sea easily. So we have hazards from pumice rafts. Uh, they're not extreme like a tsunami, but they are substantial in some cases. So pumice rafts are composed of very small fragments that are floating at the surface of the ocean. And any boat that crosses it are going to get their engine or their water intakes clogged. Uh, we've seen that many, many times. Every engine on board needs water, seawater for, for cooling the engine. And so the engines get clogged very, very easily. And you lose the power and you lose the possibility to run your engine and to get communications. So that's a problem that can occur on small vessels, but also potentially on, on big vessels. When you have a large raft arriving into a harbor, you may block the harbor entirely for several weeks or months. And if the raft is arriving into a very busy uh, maritime road, you may have to divert traffic, which creates uh, big economical problems as well. Another problem is that those pumice rafts are reflected by radar. So a radar on a boat would not identify that it's water, but would identify its, its land, right? So we end up with, if a, a boat wants to cross a raft, we will have no idea where is land, if it's land or if it's water. So then at that point, they need to rely on maps, which is fine to some extent. But if you are in a harbor with a complex uh, bathymetry, it's going to be extremely complicated to bring a boat back to the harbor. Um, other problems occur that uh, strandings, strandings have been seen to destroy some shallow marine life. If the stranding occurs for several weeks, every life that relies on sun uh, will die because it's blocked. Uh, entirely. Um, economical problems can also occur with tourism because those beaches are covered with pumice and gets less uh, appealing for, for tourists. Uh, not that it matters too much these days with COVID, but uh, that's one problem that um, has been seen. And uh, those pumice are extremely abrasive and can also scrape hulls. So we've got reports from people who got their hulls scraped that all the barnacles and life was scraped for free. And that was great. Uh, they were very happy with that, but there's also that the paint, the paint is scraped and um, it's an annoyance more than a hazard, but you, you will have to uh, uh, have serious uh, work to be on, on the hull of, of the boats that cross um, rafts. And we did some modeling of those rafts. So not only looking at satellite images, but trying to work with, uh, I worked with oceanographers and uh, try to understand the modeling, uh, to understand the dispersal of those pumice rafts and where, did we do, where would they go and try to get some um, hazard models. So those oceanographic models were uh, run by Eric van Sebier in uh, Netherlands and Robert March in the UK. Um, a pumice is basically like an iceberg, like this, this photo. You have a floating object that is that will be moved by three different forces. First, you have the, the surface, ocean, sur surface ocean currents that are going to move the pumice. So that's the, this part of the pumice is going to be moved by the surface ocean currents. And you have the wind that will have, have effect on the top, the, 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 the poking out part of the pumice. And you also have wave action that occurs and can change slightly the dispersal of those pumice rafts. But essentially, it's ocean currents and wind that drive those pumice rafts. So we did some modeling uh, with different parameters. And in those uh, images here, you see those dots with uh, a black rim. 
are actual, actual, actual satellite data. So that's the satellite data that I plotted here on the map showing what, what, which day from purple to red in time, where was the raft? And the models are also in rainbow colors, but without this uh, black rim around the dots. And you see that some models work better than others. And we have the best match with a little bit of wind and no wave action. So we have uh, something like, it's not 1% windage, it's, it's, a diff, it's a weird measurement. It's actually probably a third of the action is by wind and two thirds is by ocean currents. And in this case, we have a relatively good match of the dispersal of this raft in, by satellite images compared to the modeling here that goes a bit faster than the, than the, than the actual raft, but still goes in the same direction. And you should realize directly that can be extremely useful for hazard mitigation. So I could alert actually the authorities in Tonga and Fiji, in Fiji that the raft was arriving and when it was arriving and where it would go. And I was creating uh, maps, hazard maps every two weeks, uh, sorry, twice a week, I was creating hazard maps, um, forecasting where the raft would go. And I was uh, pretty accurate with that. And that allowed all the sailing boats and other, other boats around Fiji to avoid this pumice raft. So that was quite a, a good success. So this is a month simulation that gives us an idea of where the raft is going to go over the next month. We can also go further in time and try a two year dispersal. And you see that this volcano here in Tonga is going to potentially disperse the pumice in this area. So those models are dangerous to use because they hint cast model based on the previous years. So we look at the ocean currents and the wind from 1988 to 2007 range, and we plot where the raft is going to go depending on the data from the past. So it doesn't mean that the raft is going to go everywhere, but it's going to go in this area, right? And I've got two examples here from one from using the 1991 data only and one from the 2003 data. And one of those years is uh, also El Nino. So you've got strong differences like that. But look at Indonesia here. You've got potentially affected by the raft if it had been erupted in 1991 and most surely if it had been in 2003. So that gives us some probability on where the rafts are potentially going, uh, where they, we show that they're not going. For example, we show that they're not going towards the west or towards the north, but we have a better bracket of where the raft is going to occur over the next two years. Um, I was talking about the hazard maps I was making. That's the type of map I was managed to do. To do. That was the forecast uh, that was the actual raft where I had found the actual raft. And in red was the probability of the raft, or raft over the next week. So that was pretty rough here, but in some cases I managed to uh, decrease this, um, this plume to a much narrower um, uh, forecast. And that was uh, very useful for the maritime traffic in, these, in this area. And I was mostly, uh, bringing those maps on Facebook and word of mouth also with officials in Fiji and Tonga. And finally, I've got just two slides to talk about uh, more hazards related to um, coastal volcanism. So I'm in collaboration now with Mesam and Inham to, to bring a uh, our Australian boat, the RV investigator to Krakato Caldera. And the target is to um, get better maps and get the seismic reflection and get cores and also get the vision of the landslides from the December 2018 event. So this expedition is, uh, has been funded, but we need now permits to uh, allow the boat to, um, to, to enter in the Indonesian waters. So it's a, lot, it's a long process, but we're nearly there, hopefully. And we're going to spend about a month uh, around Krakatoa and with this big boat, it's a very big boat and very uh, functional boat. We can be um, about uh, 25 scientists on board, I think, 25 or 30 scientists. So it's a, it's a very big boat and we can do lots of stuff on it. Um, the idea is to 
better identify what happened in 2018, December 2018, to better identify the, those deposits and to infer the transport mechanisms and the generation of the tsunami. So there's a lot of research done internationally on that. We already have had boats, and Mizam is, is uh, uh, definitely uh, collaborating here with uh, other people on the, the hazards related to Anak Krakatoa and, and those deposits. But we're going to, now we're going bringing a big boat and we will be able to get uh, hopefully better data that has been done so far. So that's uh, the Krakat Anak Krakatoa that you must have, you must know about that already. We had the Krakatoa before and after 2000, uh, December 2018. And what we want is to understand what happened underwater and what triggered this tsunami exactly. So that's the map that has been already done, the bathymetry map that, sorry, bathymetry map that has been created by colleagues in the UK and Mizam. And uh, hopefully we can improve this map and get uh, even better data than has been created so far. All right, so that's the end of my uh, lecture. I'm very happy to answer questions uh, if you have any. Okay, thank you very much, Martin. It's very nice, interesting talk. And then now we are uh, in the Q and answer session. I have already just three questions. First is yep. from uh, Rudy Arif Satrio. He asked that which effort is more likely to generate a tsunami between submarine volcano eruption and earthquake or volcanic eruption on land? Yeah. Yeah. Um it's a good question because big tsunamis like Tohoku uh, tsunami or uh, the um, uh, Indonesian tsunami have been created on very long fault lines. So to create a big tsunami, you'd need to move the water not only in one place, but in many, many places in the same time. So a long, big fault is uh, the best recipe for a very big landslide, uh, for a very big uh, tsunami, sorry. Uh, if you collapse, if you create a big landslide or a big volcanic eruption on a point source, so just on the volcano, you can create tsunami for sure, but the tsunami may not be as powerful because you dissipate the energy very quickly. And because it's a point source, there's only, the wave is propagating from only one place and not just a long fracture. So the earthquake is definitely the best recipe for, an, for a tsunami. But uh, obviously, when you have a very big uh, volcanic eruption that involves caldera formation, so you have collapse of the volcano and potentially a landslide as well, you may create big, big waves as well, so definitely. Um, a deep volcano will not create much tsunami. You need to be shallow to create a tsunami. So in the case of the Krakatoa eruption, you were on the continental shelf, uh, 40 meter water depth, mostly on average. 40, 60 meters before the eruption. So that's, it was catastrophic because if you create a, create a volcanic eruption in this condition, most of the water is going to be moved. If you are in a condition with a very remote island, like in a Kamenek arc, the tsunami can be created, but it's less likely to create an enormous tsunami because the, the energy is going to be dissipated uh, through the entire water column. Does it answer the question? Okay, thank you, Martin. Yeah. Okay, for the next question, uh, we have uh, Dr. Andres Bandrio from our college, uh, for our, uh, wait, wait, wait. Uh, yeah, Pak Andri, silakan Pak. Do you want to... no, the question is on the chat on the chat <laughs> maybe okay, okay. <laughs> yeah, yes maybe you can read or or, or I, I already also when when with a speaker so yeah maybe pak andri can directly to us pak andri please oh yeah yeah uh, some ancient volcanoes like uh, submarine volcano have to be uh, produce also mineralization hydrothermal mineralization yep is also, uh, reason, uh, reason, uh, submarine volcano 
can also uh, associated with the hydrothermal submarine hydrothermal mineralization yep absolutely absolutely um, we have a, a lot of examples in the kamenek arc of uh, hydrothermal alteration and hydrothermal hydrothermal venting uh, creating ore deposits on the seafloor um, we have colleagues who managed to drill a volcano uh, north of New Zealand two years ago, something like that. And uh, they definitely hit some uh, hydrothermal alteration. We, they went also with robots and found big, those big black smokers uh, with big chimneys full of pyrite and copper and gold. Um, so you have definitely hydrothermal alteration and uh, deposition of ore deposits at those volcanoes. And actually, a large part of the mines, at, at least in Australia, uh, and in particular in, in, uh, in Tasmania, what we call the VMS or VHMS, the Volcanic Hosted Massive Sulfides, that are directly related to back volcanism. So definitely this type of volcanoes. Um, to create those uh, hydrothermal deposits, you need to be quite deep. So a few, at least 200 meters water depth, two more. Uh, 1,000 or 2,000 meters water depth to create the, the best uh, the best conditions to deposit some some ores. Uh, another type of uh, ore deposits related to submarine volcanism is um, epithermal deposits that can be created. Um, that's for sure. Uh, porphyry as well. Uh, we can have also some porphyries, but uh, in the case of porphyries, it's there, there won't be much surface expression. That will be mostly at depth under the seafloor. So there's been some um, drive to collect those ore deposits from uh, that that are in Bakak deposits. And the most um, the most uh, famous one is in the Papua New Guinea. Offshore Papua New Guinea, we have deposit the Bakak basin that is relatively shallow. And they wanted to uh, mine these deposits. And it creates extremely contentious uh, problems with uh, the low of the sea and also about um, destruction of ecosystems. So there's been a lot of um, arguments there. It's been uh, very heated over the last, uh, last years. And currently, the company who wanted to drill, uh, to, to collect in Papua New Guinea, I think the company is bankrupt. But it's something that is probably going to happen in the future, um, just simply because uh, humankind wants to get the ore deposits wherever they are. The, the major issue we have is that we, we know that mining the deep sea floor, the deep sea will affect uh, habitats over a very long period and over very large distances just because of the, the plume created by the particles uh, put in suspension. And the life uh, underwater is uh, developing much slower than on land because there's less energy, there's, there's no sun. So those, this life recovery will be extremely slow to impossible. But there's definitely ore deposits created, on the, created at submarine volcanoes and it's been a focus over the last uh, decade. The Kermadec uh, caldera system, or uh, uh, just uh, active volcano like uh, have a crater. So, uh, all right. So we have uh, in the Kermadec arc, we have lots of active volcanoes, and we can actually see with some instruments, we can see this hydrothermal venting in the water column. So we can we can put put probes not to the seafloor, but we put them in the water column, and we actually see that there's a plume coming mm. from a hydrothermal vent nearby. So mm -hmm. when you have association of volcanic activity and hydrothermal activity in the same volcano, yeah, you have that. Okay. Uh, is that uh, possible for geothermal energy, uh, the uh, such submarine volcano? Yeah, it's complicated on land already. Um, the main <laughs> problem is that those volcanoes are quite far from land. So the, how to store and transport the energy would be a, a problem. Um, technologically, um, it's, it will be extremely complex. Um, don't forget that you're also in a, con in a place where there's a lot of earthquakes because you are above a subduction zone. So the prices would be enormous. 
okay. I think we need to us to look at subal volcanism uh, first. I think there's many places in Indonesia or around the world where more um, um, geothermal energy can can be uh, captured than underwater. I think that would be that would be smarter and much cheaper to do that on land first. Thank you very much. No worries. Thank you, Pandri. Uh, okay. Before next question, uh, I will ask first to Ibu Amy or Pak Asep. Do you have any question or comment? May I? Oh, okay. Yes. Please. Well, Martin, I wonder about the rough pumice. Yep. So, well, frighten me, actually. Uh, based on the experience, the presence of rough pumice in well, Karmadek, Yep. volcanoes or whatever and can you predict the time the rough pumice will sink down yeah uh, that's a very good question actually um, it depends on the eruption so we have pumice that have been floating all around antarctica over two years time over the past two years yeah yeah two oh. years <laughs> yeah so they, those those pumice some of some sink very quickly uh, they also get abraded and get smaller, mm -hmm. but um, they can float. They can definitely float. So some pumice are going to sink immediately. Uh, we've seen that on the seafloor in Harvey, but a part of them float for almost forever. Uh, we've we've got some pumice that float for years in in the labs, no problem at all. Uh, it's so permeable that uh, it it uh, it can float. What you um, for example, in the 1883 Krakatoa eruption, there were huge pumice rafts that got created, and uh, those pumice rafts arrived in Africa. Oh. Yep. They, they got those big pumice arriving in Africa. And uh, the very uh, horrific story is that they actually even found human remains on top of those pumice. So people got uh, on top of those pumice and died there as uh, stranded on the pumice. Yeah. So those pumice so can be very big and uh, they, they can float for a very cross entire oceans. Yeah. Well, so how about them to meet, 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 mitigate that kind of question? Yeah, to mitigate, uh, it's, well, it, it, it's a problem because you it's a it's a big mass right if you if you have a big pumice raft arriving in a harbor um, I've seen that on satellite images if the island is badly shaped that it collects a lot of pumice rafts and that the the winds are pushing the rafts onto the coast it will be extremely hard to to mitigate that so you may create nets nets to, to in, uh, not allow the, the pumice to enter the harbor but that would require a lot of engineering beforehand, right? And uh, there's nothing created like that uh, so far. So yeah, those rafts can really block a region for a while. And now, nowadays we've got airports and, uh, and uh, roads that you would be able to bring goods and supplies to a, stranded, to, a, to, a, to a city that has been stranded, but it could really affect the harbor entirely for, for a long while. And you could collect that, so you could collect them and uh, move them somewhere else, but the, the volumes are extremely big. Yeah, so yeah like that much, you know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Wow. Okay. The, the Havre raft, uh, mm -hmm. I didn't mention that in my talk, but the Havre raft uh, created very large pumice that were meters in size, right? So it's, it's very difficult to, to navigate through that already. Uh, the raft yeah. was two to four meters thick, we estimate. So probably very big pumice on top of each other. And the volume was a cubic kilometer, yeah. a cubic kilometer of material. So we were very, very fortunate that this volcano was in the middle of nowhere and nobody saw it and nobody got really affected by it. But despite this, you have the entire coast of Australia, Eastern coast of Australia that got littered by pumice. And if you have a submarine volcano in Indonesia creating this type of eruption, you would have you would be in big problem. Yeah. 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 
We can model okay. where the pumice would go. Um, we can model that. So yeah, I've just... got a worldwide modeling, so I can also see, for example, in the Mediterranean, there would be a problem uh, because these pumice rocks would be kind of stuck in the in the, in the Mediterranean, Mediterranean Sea. Uh, in in Indonesia, I would be a bit um, worried because uh, you have so many islands that could be affected like that. Yeah. So. Yeah. We just wait. <laughs> <laughs> but what what you can relativize as well is that over the last uh, hundred years, there's no real record of pumice raft yeah. except Krakatoa, and Krakatoa eruption or the, the raft of Krakatoa got moved directly towards the the west and didn't affect Indonesia for that long. But Krakatoa would have been more to the east; it could have affected a large part of the Indonesian sea. So, Mirsam and Idam, you have to be careful with that raft, Thomas, <laughs> <laughs> from the Anna Karkato. You have to think about, well, at, yes. least, at least you have to think about. Uh, yes, yes, yes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. No worries. Thank okay. you, Martin. Okay. My pleasure. Uh, next, Pak uh, Asep, do you have, uh, or Pak Ngejam, do you have question yeah. or comment? Yeah, okay. Ma yeah, okay, Martin. Actually, maybe you already heard from 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 Sebastian, from the University of Birmingham, and also from Alessandro that we are we are thinking about the possibility of floating material from Anakarakato on the last eruption. Uh, yeah. Since uh, there is some some uh, some evidence, some advices that they found uh, the floating material around around the 2018 eruption. So okay, yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, I, I have not followed that much, um, mm -hmm. but uh, yeah, it's interesting to, to think about it. Considering Krak Anak Krakato eruption, the, the material is more, more mafic, it's more like basalt. So the floating time will be extremely reduced because those materials that we call scoria are going to sink very relatively fast, most, most likely. Uh, there's always exceptions, right? But it's the, the volumes are much smaller uh, with an eruption like this, and the material is going, most of the material is going to sink. So it's only yeah, when yeah. you are in endosites and rhyolites that you're going to have potential issues with Pamis Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, nevertheless, it's very interesting to, to get some data about the floating material from 2018. Extremely extra interesting. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, yeah, so that's why we are uh, we are thinking to compare with the Tonga eruption, yep. and then once once we got the data, I think we can rethinking about the uh, I think the triggering mechanism of the tsunamis at 2018. Yep. So far, we are thinking just about the landslide or the underwater eruption yeah, without without uh, without flooding material generation. Yeah. Uh, Besides that, uh, Martin, in Indonesia, uh, we have some several volcanoes located in the middle of the ocean, for example, Banda Sea in the in eastern Indonesia, maybe you already heard, and then in the Tomini Gulf, we have Una Una or uh, yeah. Una Una volcano, and, and there are also Gamma Lama. Yeah, how about the pos possibility in the future? Are you interested yeah. to, visit, uh, to visit them? <laughs> Of course. <laughs> no, okay. um, yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yes, yes. yeah, no, absolutely. I'm, I'm very keen on uh, Indo Indonesian volcanoes, for sure. Uh, mm. And I think it has, it has, it, it really captures my interest because it's, um, it, Indonesia is so particular with so many islands that uh, things can get very complicated there with the, Either pumice rafts or simply by the, the, the style of volcanism that occurred there. So I'm, I'm quite keen, yeah, of course. Right. Okay, then I think that's okay. all. There is another question in the question and answer session. Maybe you can read. Okay. Yeah. Uh, next, last question, maybe. <laughs> this is Martin. Mm -hmm. This is from the Asfar, from the Mike Park Re Reinsurance. When yeah. the submission volcano erupt, Will there be any poisonous gas or chemical product or eruption that potentially endangers sea ecosystem nearby? And related with the pumice rough case, if the pumice rough dissolve, 
will it produce dangerous chemical compound? Yep. That one. Um, 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 so a submarine volcano erupted in 19, I think 55, at Colombo volcano close to Santorini in Greece. And this volcano is very shallow uh, and erupted underwater about 50 meters water. So very, very shallow. And I think it was 19, yeah, about the 1950s. And actually there was a uh, 55 death related to this volcanic eruption on Santorini related to volcanic gases. So those volcanic gases traveled over the sea, but were denser than the atmosphere and were concentrated enough to poison, uh, asphyxiate people on land. Um, so just because it was relatively close nearby, um, it was very unfortunate that we had those fatalities. So yes, if those submarine volcanoes can release enough gas that to, uh, to asphyxiate people uh, nearby. If you wait a couple of hours of, or days, I think these, these gas will be fully mixed in the atmosphere and not create any more uh, problem. But you know that CO2 is denser than the atmosphere. So if you create a lot of CO2, um, we, you can create a pocket that travels in between the, the water and the atmosphere. Uh, so we have a CO2 released by submarine volcanoes. So it doesn't, it's not toxic, but it, it's like it can asphyxiate somebody because there's no more oxygen present. Uh, you don't really have, you have some poisonous gas from volcanoes. You have, uh, well, uh, sulfuric acid that can be, uh, yeah, sulfuric, sulfur gas that can be uh, poisonous. Um, the sea ecosystem nearby, that's a question because we don't, we don't have any data for that. Uh, would the sea ecosystem be disturbed by this? We do not, we don't, we do not know. Probably, but we don't know. Uh, in the case of the Pamis raft, I have reports from those sailing boats crossing a raft several days after the eruption that they could smell sulfur. So they, there was a little hint of sulfur because those Pamis were abrading onto each other and releasing sulfur in the trapped vesicles. But that, uh, that was just an annoyance more than anything. But it's interesting to actually realize that this sulfur gas is, was released several days after the eruption, up to a week after the eruption, we had still this sulfur smell uh, witnessed or recorded by the, by, the, by the boats crossing the raft. Yeah. Um, we, if you consider a deep submarine, submarine eruption, those gas will, the poisonous gas will probably be uh, dissolved into seawater very quickly. So they won't remain as a gas, but they will be dissolved into the seawater. And so you can create seawater that can be toxic for some um, uh, ecosystems, but uh, it is just, uh, it's just a hypothesis. I, I do not know what concentration you need to, to be actually a poisonous for the, the ecosystems. We're not that far in, sci in, in, in science so far. We, we just, uh, we're, not, we're not at that level yet. Yeah. We, we're trying to understand the, the recovery, the life recovery after uh, submarine eruptions. And that's already a challenge to, to see the, how long the, the life will recover and recolonize this area. Uh, you need a lot of surveys to be able to, to monitor that. And that, that's, uh, that's a real trouble to, to already organize that many cruises. Okay, thank you, Martin. Uh, and how, how about the? Uh, is there any possibility the pumice is will be dissolved? No, you don't dissolve a pumice. <laughs> um, you don't dissolve a pumice. You, you will. Uh, it will get abraded. If you, the pumice arrive on a beach, it yeah. will get abraded in the surf zone very fast because it's very fragile material. Yeah. Um, but you don't dissolve it because it's uh, it's it's glass, volcanic glass, and you don't mm -hmm. dissolve that. You can alter it. Uh, but it will take a while in in the sea conditions. If you if you are in uh, in a hot condition, um, you may have uh, yeah transformation of the glass into a different product. 
But if you're at the surface of the sea, you do not you know, do not dissolve these tonnes. No. Okay. It's stable enough to stay uh, like that. Okay, thank you, Martin. Uh, uh, because the time is almost finished. Okay. Uh, we will... Yeah, I think uh, the time is in enough. So we have finished the guest lecture of the day. We have learned yep. a lot today regarding the uh, recent advan advances and hazard mitigation in submarine volcanism. I mean, what we have learned today will be useful for us in the future. Before we close this session, uh, Martin, do you have uh, I mean, give the some uh, short close? <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah, um, I just got uh, Modi Sandra asking for sharing the presentation material. I'm I'm happy to share this. Um, either well, you can find that on YouTube, I think. But if you want the PDF, I can also uh, maybe Mezam can organize this because he received the PDF. Yes, the yes, person. please. Okay. So you can send um, to me, and then I will deliver to the attendee. Okay. Okay. Yeah, yeah, so that's all fine. Um, yeah, I know. I'm, I was uh, very pleased to be. Uh, uh, to, to have this, this, uh, the, the opportunity to, to, to do this lecture. I'm very happy with that and happy to do another one if, uh, later on if, uh, if interested. Um, no, that was a great opportunity for me and uh, I, I wish the students all the best uh, in their studies. And uh, I know it's very difficult with learning online. It's also very difficult to teach online. <laughs> Yeah. Um, <laughs> <Yes>. it, <laughs> I think everybody will agree, agree with this. It's uh, yeah. it's a very different dimension to to teach in front of a screen compared to in front of an audience. But uh, yeah. I hope that you can understand that uh, we um, it yeah things can be difficult, but uh, persevere and uh, continue studies. And uh, I'm sure that you will uh, one day find back the normal seminars and normal lectures. Yeah. So I wish you the best, and um, yeah, hopefully uh, I will be able to come to Indonesia uh, in the in the near future for this uh, voyage and for collaboration. And I also be very interested to uh, bring uh, Mizam and Idham and others uh, to Tasmania for research. So thank you for this opportunity, and um, yeah, I wish you the best. Okay, thank you, Martin. <laughs> Okay, Be before we close, and I will inform some information that uh, next week we will have another interesting guest lecture. Yeah, please check the date throughout the official Instagram of Faculty of Art, Science, and Technology ITV. And then, once again, thank you, uh, Dr. Martin. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ibu Emi, Mas Miriam, Pak Asep, dan yang lainnya. Uh, see you next week. Stay healthy and have a nice weekend. Before close, uh, let's take picture together. <laughs> For the attendant, please open the uh, photo and uh, the video. Pa Andri, Pa Asep. One, two. Three. Okay. Once more. Wait a minute. <laughs> okay. Once again. One, two, three. Okay. <laughs> Thank you very Thank much. You. Thank, you, Thank you, Martin. Thank you, Martin. Yeah, my pleasure. Yeah, thank you, Martin. I will send you. Yeah, thank you, Martin. I will. Yeah, I will send you a good news about the permit. Yeah, thank you. Mas. Baik, terima kasih Pak Ida, Mbak Hana, terima kasih Pak Andri uh, ya. <laughs> ya, Pak Andri, nanti, ya. Sam nanti sampai ketemu minggu depan ya Yang kuliah dari University of Birmingham ya Sebastian Ya, Sebastian okay. Baik Mas nah. Mbak Hana, terima kasih Mbak Hana Kita akhiri Mbak Hana ya Terima kasih Saya
Lift dulu ya, Mas. Juga pamit, ya, Mangga. Assalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.